All right, let's get started. This is Coffee and Chat with Rev Bruce. I am here today kicking off Black History Month, and we're doing this talking about the origin story of the HBCU, looking at how historically Black colleges and universities originated, as well as how do we keep this going? How do we sustain um, this legacy that we know as historically Black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs. Um, let me be real and transparent. I am one of the ones who attended a historically black college and university. I attended Morehouse College. I am a product of their summer bridge outreach. I was still in high school when I went to Atlanta and spent um, a good deal of my summer there with other individuals who were a little older than me who were transitioning into their freshman year. And so I got a taste of a historically black college early on. And then I went on to go ahead and apply at Morehouse and be accepted. And I attended Morehouse for two years, um, graduated um, from high school in 88 and went on to Morehouse College. And so I will be one of the first people to tell you there is nothing, nothing like the experience that you receive at a historically Black college. And so I'm not just speaking from a data standpoint. I'm also speaking from an experience standpoint. And having been at a Black college, especially in Atlanta, right, with the AUC, right, the Atlanta University Center, you know I was hanging out at Clark, Atlanta University. I was hanging out with some friends at Morris Brown. Uh, you know, it, it was it was cool. Visited Tuskegee, a couple other black colleges. So I've been there and I've had the experience. And so this is part of me reaching back and trying to reach out and help out folks understand about historically black colleges. If you, if you understand the story, please jump in, chime in in the comments and let's keep this going. So here it is. When we talk about historically black colleges, there's some basic facts that we need to look at, right? And those basic facts are some things that we don't always talk about or hear about uh, when we talk about historically black colleges. And so I want us to just dive into this real quick. And this is what we have to look at. Um, just from the data that's in, 2021, 99 HBCUs within 19 states, the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And of those 99 HBCUs, 50 are public institutions and 49 being private nonprofit institutions. What that breaks down to is we're about 50-50 when it comes to private versus public. And that's gonna make a difference when we start talking about philanthropy and funding and how some of these schools were established and what the basis of that establishment of these black schools were, um, particularly in our history, when we talk about Black History Month, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's difficult to celebrate Black History Month without talking black education and black education was the premise for Black History Month. And so I'm gonna say it, Black History Month is about Black education, and Black educators should have input on Black History Month. I'm going to move on, but this is data that comes from NCS, a uh, part of the Department of the National Department of Ed, the U.S. Department of Ed. And so please understand that this data isn't just something that I pulled out of my hat or just grabbed off of Wikipedia, which you'll see some other examples from Wikipedia. Um, HBCUs, they are to educate black students, but they also enroll other races. When I went to Morehouse, I went to school with Asian students, I went to school with white students, went to school with um, some Latino students, right? When, when, I, when I attended class at Spelman, right? There were some people who were non-black students attending. And right now, based upon the data for 2021, you'll see that non-Black students have made up 25% of HBCU enrollment. 
And so given the influx of HBCU students, when you talk about information and films that have promoted HBCUs, you've got uh, Coach Prime promoting HBCU sports and, you know, all of that combines to increase the awareness and then the enrollment based upon applications for HBCUs. When, when, when I went to Morehouse, school days, Morehouse grad, Spike Lee made school days and a whole bunch of people applied to Morehouse, Clark, Spelman, based upon what they saw on school days. They wanted that experience that they had saw on the screen. They wanted that experience that they had seen with Spike Lee and and everything that they saw with the ringing of the bell and wake up, wake up, wake up. They wanted that experience. And so now that experience right now, based upon the latest data has been expanded to about a quarter of the population being non-black. Hope you're still good with that. That still comes from the Department of Ed. And so when we look at this, we, we have to talk about there are notable graduates of historically black colleges and universities. Uh, current vice president went to Howard, Oprah, TSU, Tennessee State University. We're gonna have a couple of TSUs, right? That's how it works. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King went to M Morehouse College, right? We'll take that along with Otis Moss, a couple other famous ministers, Howard Thurman, but I digress. Uh, the first black U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, not only did he go to Lincoln University, but he also went to Howard University and NFL Hall of Famer and TV uh, host, Michael Strahan went to Texas Southern University. And so those are some famous HBCU grads, famous HBCU grads, right? Still coming from the Department of Ed as far as information. And so, boom, there are different types of HBCUs. Think about this, different types of HBCUs. And when we talk about that, remember I mentioned there were private, there were public, right? Different types of institutions. And so when we look at this, let's take this into account, right? There are the public institutions, right? And when this is a screenshot of Wikipedia, just so you can see what happens when, um, other people tell your story, okay? Just so you know, when other people tell your story, this is what you get, right? It says most HBCUs were established in the South after the American Civil War, often with the assistance of religious missionary organizations based in Northern, the Northern United States, right? And it goes into the whole thing about, um, there were some that were established prior to the Civil War. But why start off with most of them were established after, right? And so keep that in mind. That's how they introduced it. Most of them were started afterwards, right? And so a lot of things with HBCUs, you'll see that they originated as one name and then they evolved and changed into something else, right? Uh, for instance, Cheney being the first HBCU, the oldest HBCU in the nation, Cheney was originally um, the Institute for Colored Youth, right? They started with five students. Right? It wasn't a big thing, right? I got I got friends who graduated from Cheney, you know, much love, right? And then you've also got Wilberforce, which was started before uh, the Civil War, before the Civil War, not after the Civil War, but before the Civil War, both of these, right? And Wilberforce being established by the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, right, of Ohio. And also with some help from the White Methodist Episcopal Church, okay? And so those are there to show you, okay, here's some of the root foundations of the private institutions. Atlanta University was also started as a private institution, as well as Shaw, Shaw uh, down in uh, South Carolina, established as a HBCU, which was private. Then go over here. And then you got the public institutions. So you got this thing about certain schools 
were established later on based upon land grants, land grants from the government. And so when we start talking about your AME, A&Ms, right? Your A&Ms, right? A lot of your A&Ms were established based upon land grants because those land grants were to help fund education in particular trades and industries, right? And so with that, those land grants were set up and a lot of these schools were set up as public institutions with public dollars and that's how they got set up, all right? So that's the two types. So here's the philanthropy of it, okay? And when we talk about the philanthropy of it, I want you to understand there's a difference between public and private. There's a difference between how people operate based upon being a nonprofit, private um, academic institution and those being a public academic institution, both being of higher ed, okay? And so when we look at this and how they operate, how they originated, um, you'll see a big difference in it. And then you'll see a difference between the influence of black philanthropy and white philanthropy, right? Black leadership and a government having a hand in it, a faith-based organization having a hand in it, um, powerful individuals having a hand in it. You'll, you'll see the difference in it. So let's look at this. Most HBCUs, according to this, right, which comes from hbcufirst.com, were started by philanthropists and free blacks. Y'all got that? Southern states at the behest of the federal government. Remember, I mentioned the land grants. That's part of that. And religious organizations such as the American Missionary Association, AMA. That's how Spelman got established. And the African Methodist Episcopal AME Church. That's where you get your Morris Browns. That's where you get your Wilberforce. Right? Those are schools established based upon different types of philanthropy, different types of investment and funding. And so you have those that are private philanthropists, right? Cheney, uh, a Quaker, um, Humphrey started that. I'll get into that in just a minute. He started that. And Free Blacks, right? Got involved with starting HBCUs. And then you have, as I mentioned, the Southern states, with land grants from the government establishing HBCUs and religious organizations establishing HBCUs. Uh, most HBCUs are connected to a church, um, some form of religious affiliation, uh, one way or another. So, all right, Morehouse. Morehouse has a seminary. And that seminary is primarily Baptist, right? Martin Luther King was Baptist. Otis Moss, Baptist, Howard Thurman. Um, pretty much Baptist and then started one of the largest non-denominational churches in the 1940s um, that connected with also another church to create a mixed congregation. But that's what Morehouse was back, connected to Baptist. Xavier, Xavier, Xavier College, Xavier University, <laughs> Catholic, right? So we've, we've got all these different affiliations. Morris Brown, AME, right? Morris Brown, named after the second bishop, named after the one who was, you know, uh, hanging out with Den Denmark Vesey. Morris Brown, that's, what that, that's where that comes from, right? That's somebody's name, okay? There's history behind that and understand that that's how they're connected. That's how they originated. So according to Britannica, the first HBCUs were founded in Pennsylvania and Ohio, right? before the Civil War, right? Different than what Wikipedia was coming out with initially talking about most HBCUs were established after the Civil War. That's that's not the leading statement. Here's a, a leading statement that tells us not only when they were established, but also the purpose for them being established for providing Black youth who were largely prevented due to racial discrimination from attending established colleges and universities 
with a basic education and training to become teachers or tradesmen. Keep that in mind, to become teachers and tradesmen. And so one of the things that used to happen in much, much of the black community was for individuals to be funded and supported by the community, the church, in order to go out, get educated and come back and teach the children as well as some of the adults what they had learned, right? Um, you see it in um, Ernest Gaines, A Lesson Before Dying. The, the brother had been sent out and come back to be a teacher in his community in Louisiana, right? And so a lot of that was that investment that we hear a lot from when we talk about W.E.B. versus Booker T., that investment in the talented 10th. Who's, who's this child that shows promise and, and, and discipline that we can get behind and he can be a, a educational academic cornerstone for our community and we can send him out and he can come back and share with another group of our children and then we can continue this generationally, okay? And so that was part of what happened when we talk about education in the black community and how black colleges were also utilized. Then you have Wikipedia talking about the differences between the um, institutions that were set up before the Civil War, right? And most of these that they talk about are the ones that are set up during the Reconstruction and after the Reconstruction, you know, and they talk about different concentrations of that. Remember the initial HBCUs are set up in Pennsylvania and Ohio, right? Which were different types of states. They weren't the, the full Northern states and Pennsylvania being a state that had a lot of Quaker influence and Ohio being the state where a lot of blacks who escaped slavery um, went to obtain freedom. Right? So it makes sense. White philanthropy, black religious organizations, free blacks. That's the, that's the cornerstone for the origination of some of the early, early HBCUs. Let, let's, let's keep going. So then we look at this, right? And we see Cheney, Richard Humphreys, a Quaker and silversmith, he established Cheney and it was established, right? And, and, and they named it the African Institute. The African Institute, this was in 1837. What else was prominent at that time? The Free African Society, which was an arm of what Absalom Jones, right? And Richard Allen did in Pennsylvania, along with establishing the AME Church. Hope y'all get that, right? So using African wasn't offensive to anyone. It, it was associated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. It was associated with the Free African Society, a, a society that was funded to help aid enslaved Africans transition from enslavement to freedom in the North. And this school also changed its name a few months later to the, color, the Institute for Colored Youth. That's what it was. This is still Cheney, right? Now, at his death, right? Humphreys left $10,000 to the Philadelphia, Philadelphia yearly meeting of Society of Friends for the purpose of establishing a school for, listen to this, instructing the descendants of the African race in school learning in various branches of the mechanical arts, right? Mechanical arts, we're talking about trade, and trades and in agriculture in order to prepare and fit 
and qualify them to act as teachers. They were going to get skills, learn a trade, learn an art, a mechanical art, and then reach back and teach others. That's That was the intention. That was why he left the money. That was what he set up as the purpose for this contribution. Then you look at Wilberforce, 1856, still before the Civil War. What is this? This is the Methodist Episcopal Church, right? Setting this up in what is now known as Wilberforce, Ohio, right? And its primary goal was African-Americans having access to college education. This is the first, the first private black college, right? The first one to be owned and operated by African-Americans. Boom, take that into consideration. It's affiliated with the AME Church of Ohio. It is owned and operated by African-Americans. That's that that was mind blowing when we consider much of what's become of some of our institutions today. Take that in. Then you've got Spelman, right? Liberal Arts College, designed for women. And it was opened in Georgia in 1881, right? And so con consider this. Consider this. Before it was open, a New England organization called the Women's American Baptist Home Mission Society secured funds for a college for freed women in the, in the city. Approximately 100 African-American women soon began attending school at the institution they created, the Atlanta Female Baptist Seminary. The Atlanta Female Baptist Seminary. Take that in consideration. That was the name. That was what they started as, right? And then, lo and behold, instructed by four white northern-born teachers, the students took classes in the basement of an Atlanta church until two of those teachers made a fateful visit to Cleveland, Ohio, a Cleveland, Ohio Baptist church in June of 1882. Two members of the congregation, John D. Rockefeller and his wife, guess what her name was? Laura Spellman donated funds to the school. So wait a minute. I thought this school was called the Atlanta Female Baptist Seminary. Mm-hmm. Right? But once they got the donation from John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman, that school eventually became Spelman, right? The Rockefellers visited Atlanta to celebrate the third anniversary of the seminary two years later. And during the, the trustees renamed the institution Spelman to honor Mrs. Rockefeller's abolitionist family. There you go. That's, that's where it came from. That's how it came about. And so, Boom, we need black philanthropy in our HBCUs. We're not saying that we don't need white philanthropy. We're not saying that we can't use white philanthropy. We're not saying that we can't use funds from the government and grants and things of that nature in order to fund black education at historically black colleges and universities. But we do need black philanthropy. We do need individuals who will give funds to support black education at black institutions. That just makes sense as a formula. And so take this into consideration. When I was still attending Morehouse, the, 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 the fees were going up. The fees were going up, right? And 
at homecoming. Come on. My freshman year at homecoming, Bill Cosby announced a major contribution to that institution. The Olympics were announced and, and, and the Olympics were coming to town and major funding was coming into that institution at that time. And so when we talk about black philanthropy as well as public funds, that was a combination that was utilized and interwoven in order to sustain and strengthen Morehouse's position within a major city in the South. Take that in. Take that in. And as we go through this, think about it. Black philanthropy isn't just Black dollars as far as just, here you go, I'm going to contrib contribute to United Negro College Fund. Here's a drop in the bucket. It's beyond just donations and endowments and contributions directly to the black colleges. We, we, we have recruitment campaigns that occur within black colleges. Um, black college tours, um, there's probably a high school or a social group, the Lynx, the, the Deltas, somebody in the Divine Nine is uh, some, some black educator that, that's a, HBCU grad or alumni is, is trying to organize, they're trying to organize a college tour, a black college tour to at least hit the, the eastern coast or the or the or the southernmost coast of the US and hit these black colleges. Help fund that, offer input on getting that done. You know, share at a parent meeting your experience at a black college. Do that. Do that as part of your philanthropy, your part as part of reaching back and giving back in order to continue this legacy of black education at black institutions. Um, beyond that, black college expos. Um, there's a recent one here, right? A friend of mine is a pastor of a local church. He went to Texas Southern, played football with Strahan, right? They had a black college tour, right? Him and his, his frat brothers were instrumental in, in being involved in that. That's the type of thing you need to have in engaging your community, right? In order to promote the legacy of black education through black philanthropy, right? You, you, you've got plenty of arguments that can be made about, well, you know, this isn't who we are or what we've done and, and they've got funding for that. Yeah, okay, but here, go, here goes the thing. They've got funding for it, right? They've got funding for it, but in the sense of taking ownership of it and making a contribution, we can do more. Right? We can do more. We can do more as Black educators. We can do more as Black activists. We can do more as Black artists. We can do more as Black business people. We can do more, and we can do more to support Black education as a whole. And so as we do that, when we do that, we can continue this legacy that was established both privately and publicly with the purpose of educating black youth, of educating black communities, of educating individuals who were marginalized within their own areas from receiving a quality education. We can change that, but it starts with us. It starts with us and as we do this, we have to look at this from a standpoint of how does our contribution, how does our contribution make a difference in making any of these institutions, any of these institutions an established 
institution that is sustained and strengthened by our support. Black colleges and universities need Black philanthropy to continue this legacy, this legacy of Black education. God bless.